All right. Good morning, everyone, and uh, or good evening, depending on where you're coming from. Uh, we are in Singapore, sunny Singapore. The weather is pretty good today. Um, thank you for attending our inaugural um, CISO uh, series of talks. Uh, I have with me my partner, Kian Williams of Class LLC. So we have been collaborating with uh, Kian on our VCSO program in Singapore. And uh, this is a, a very intimate topic that we, we come across every day. Uh, a lot of businesses are having their needs to balance uh, business objective and security obligations. So uh, it is always a good topic to, to discuss. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, welcome Kians to, to address us on the topic today. And at any point in time, anybody have uh, additional question, feel free to uh, type into the chat box and uh, uh, we will be able to uh, help you with that. Kian? So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining me and Alex for this presentation. Um, if you have been doing a lot of Zoom during COVID-19, I do wanna let you know that this is gonna be a different kind of presentation. We only have a few slides. The slides are meant to guide a discussion, but we intentionally did this as a meeting rather than a webinar. The objective is to bring everybody into the conversation, to make it more interactive, and to lead us to a successful conversation rather than this being a session where I'm just talking to you and you have no opportunity to respond. Um, for those of us who are joining live, if you click on the participants button in Zoom, you will find at the bottom of the screen that you have all kinds of voting buttons. You can click yes, you can click no, you can tell me to go faster, you can tell me to go slower, you can raise your hand, but these buttons are going to create an opportunity for us to give you an opportunity to share your thoughts or share your ideas. Alternatively, you can just post your ideas in the chat. One of the reasons that Alex and I decided to have this conversation, as he said, is that everybody is always asking about, well, how do you develop your cybersecurity strategy? How do you align with the business? How do I get the business to do what I'm telling them to do is the question that security people ask. And the business often asks, what are these security people talking about? And so the idea is that there is a disconnect between the security people who are supporting risk management in the organization and the business people that have to make all the risk management decisions. If you've ever spent time in a executive leadership course, the certified CISO course is a good example. And inside that certification program, what you hear throughout the five days of training is that the mission of security is to align with the business. One of the challenges and one of the difficulties when you're trying to do that is that many security people don't understand what the business is doing. They're instead focused on everything else. You know, I have compliance obligations. I have very interesting security controls. I have um, things that I'm trying to do that were part of my security education that are not always interesting to the business because you haven't formatted the conversation properly or because you haven't presented data that's going to resonate with the business. Our objective in this conversation today, again, whether you're listening live or you listen to the recording later, what we would really like to do is highlight things that are going to help security and the business come together, achieve harmony, and then support their real mission, which is help whatever business they're working in achieve success. If I'm working in education, there's gonna be a strategy for success where education is a business practice and security as a protection mechanism are going to come together and make sure that we deliver education services to our students. If our business is healthcare, then the healthcare delivery service where we're making people healthy and making them feel better is going to come together with security to make sure that activity is protected and that the mission of the business, not compliance, not regulatory requirements, not some kind of legal requirement, but the true mission and the objective of the business is what we're really working to satisfy. Over the uh, course of the hour, as we go through the slides, again, you have every opportunity to jump in, but the conversation is based on time that Alex and I have spent working with businesses to help them develop strategy. It also comes from the time that I've been spent personally as an executive trainer and executive instructor. And so everything that we're talking about is really a collection of um, fairy tales and war stories that paints a picture about how this works and what you can expect 
in terms of the, the success that you can achieve with your organization. For those of you who have technical security backgrounds, a lot of the items that we talk about are going to be business oriented, but the more we talk about business, the more you start to realize the way that you have to communicate with your counterparts, the way that you want to frame the arguments, the way that you want to present your ideas, that is going to resonate much more in a business context than it is going to resonate in a security context, especially if your organization is not delivering security as a service. Now, the conversation is going to change if you're an MSP or an MSSP or if you deliver security software, but for the majority of people in the world, security is a component of the business and is meant to help the business achieve success rather than being the primary product or service of the organization. Uh, the first idea to talk about is the idea from Peter Drucker. I think it was in 2005 when he originally said this and then it was taken by Ford and turned into a strategic initiative. But the idea that culture eats strategy for breakfast is that the culture of the organization is going to play a huge role in the way that the company is going to address any kind of need whether it's a business need, whether it's a security need, whether it's your relationship with your third parties and the contractors that are supporting your organization, the way that you go about doing things, your attitudes, your perspectives, your beliefs, the ideas of the organization, what they identify as important, all of those components are going to influence how do you go about doing the business of the company. And so the idea that culture is strategy for breakfast is that your strategy, your capabilities, and your culture all need to be aligned with each other. And the culture of the organization is going to drag your capability and your strategy along with them. If I do things properly, if I have a good culture and I have a cyber aware culture, then cybersecurity as an underlying idea or the underlying driver for the business is going to cause our capabilities and our strategy to go in a direction that is secure. Whereas if we have a culture that is corrupt, people aren't following directions, we have immature organizational maturity, everybody can do whatever they want, it makes it much more difficult for the organization to be on the same page, to focus on the right problems, and for everybody to accomplish the goal. And so all three need to be designed together, starting with culture as the founding principle, and once you establish your culture and you define what is the right way of doing things? How are we going to treat people? How are we going to operate our business? How are we going to prioritize our activities? How are we going to solve problems? The answer to all those questions are going to be part of the culture that you establish within your organization. If people can just do what they want to do and they're focused on their bonus and they don't think about anything else, then that's going to produce an environment that doesn't work very well for strategy it's also going to produce an environment that doesn't work very well for security. Um, one of the things that we teach in our executive course is the idea that the maturity of the organization has a significant impact on how well security is going to operate. So if you look at something like the CMMI model from ISACA, or you look at the uh, maturity models from the Department of Defense or from the US government, any security model related to, or any maturity model related to cybersecurity is going to start at a level zero or a level one where everything is chaotic. There's no control, there are no policies, nobody's following any of the rules, nobody's following any of the requirements. And as you start to strengthen your culture, you start to strengthen the rules, you start to put things in place. What you discover is that over time, as the maturity of the organization increases, the stability and the perspective and the behaviors of the organization also increase. And so if I start off at a level one and it is complete chaos, and then I put a policy in place and the corporate policy starts to describe how the organization is going to behave. And at this point, we're not even talking about security policy. We're just talking about corporate policy. You know, you take something as simple as everybody is going to show up to work by 9 a.m. local time. And that is a requirement that is enforced because people are showing up all throughout the day and you can't schedule a meeting because nobody's in the office at the same time. And starting with that small step, just the policy that says everybody is going to arrive at the same time, they're gonna log into their computers. If everybody arrives at nine o'clock, you should be relaxed 
and ready to go by 10 o'clock, now the business can start to figure out how are we going to collaborate? How are we going to prioritize? How are we going to plan? How are we going to deliver our services? And then you build upon that initial seed of culture that was planted, where now the organization starts to think about where are we going? How are we getting there? How are we going to work together? How are we going to win? How did we, how do we define winning? You know, what capabilities need to be in place to execute our strategy? The answer to all these questions and more all starts with the culture that's established at the organization. You know, for anybody on the call, whether you're listening live or you listen to the recording, if you've ever been in the military, the military has a very special culture that is so strong that even people outside the military have assumptions and beliefs about the attitude and the approach that the military is going to use. You know, people walk in formation. They're very aligned. They're very rigid. You have a clear line of command. People don't break the line of command. If you have a general and the general gives an order, everybody's going to follow that order all the way down to the last soldier that's left if it's a combat situation or people are going to do what we need to do during peaceful times because the leadership sets the direction everybody else follows and there's no argument you know that example is a good representation of whether you agree or disagree or whether you think it's good or bad it's still a representation of culture and a strong culture where people fall inside the boundaries they don't break the rules and they don't go outside of what is established. And so if we establish good culture, the organization can start to think about what is important. What do we want to highlight? How do we want to make people get on board with where we're going and what we're doing and the way that we do it? And the cultural imperatives that you define are now going to start to separate your organization from another organization. You know, if you've joined us after the beginning of this presentation and you thought that you were coming to hear about executive cybersecurity strategy, and you're like, wait a second, what is all this business about culture? Did I come to the right meeting? The important thing to take away from the conversation is that if I'm going to do security well, I have to start with the business. You know, security is an security is a component that adds to the success of the business. Security in very rare circumstances is going to drive the business and cause the business to achieve what it wants to achieve. And so if I start with the business perspective, then I'm going to end in a place where we can start to think about how are we going to align security in the business? How are we going to align IT in the business? How are we going to align finance in the business? Security is, one ju security is just one department among multiple departments that all work together to achieve whatever the outcome is. And so if we start with the business perspective and we start to answer the regular questions, you know, if you have children and your children are writing an essay, they always say that you have to answer um, six questions in an essay. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Those same questions that you would do in a um, elementary essay are the same questions that the business is going to have to answer when you think about the drivers. A business driver is simply something that is going to influence the direction that the business goes and the way that it conducts or manages its activities. And so when we think about who, the who is really just the stakeholders. Is it people inside the business? Are there people external to the business? Do you have shareholders who, uh, who have invested and they want to receive a return? Do you have employees who have taken a lower salary because they believe in the mission and they want to see the greater good done because your organization exists for philanthropy, not to generate a profit? But understanding who you're dealing with is going to be very important because it starts to define the culture that's appropriate for the organization. And once you establish the culture and you understand what drives the business, now I can start to answer my security questions. But answering the question about who is just the first step. There are other questions that need to be answered so that you understand the business context that I'm operating in, because the business context is also going to help you identify your problems, the risks that you're facing, the things that you have to address so that the ultimate mission of the business can be accomplished in the way that we want to accomplish it. And so once you identify who is concerned about what we're doing, you also have to identify what exactly are we doing. You know, if you go to any corporation and you look at the organizational chart, what you'll find is that there are numerous people on the organization chart, but there's no indication about what they're doing or how they're contributing. You know, if I'm, if I'm in a manufacturing organization 
and I'm, my organization exists to produce widgets because every class in business school, the product of business is always a widget. If we're producing widgets, I need to define what kind of widget. Is it a gold widget? Is it an iron widget? Is it a steel widget? What's the size of the widget? How is it designed? What is the schematic? What is the layout? What is the purpose? The answer to all of these questions starts to define for you as a security person and should be defined by the business. Why do we exist? If we exist to make widgets and our widgets are gold, well, a gold widget is going to serve some purpose under some circumstance. Maybe it's going to be in a Rolex watch rather than in the engine of a um, Jeep or an off-road vehicle. The when question starts to talk about the history of the organization and what they have been doing and where they plan to go. Uh, when is often a good question to ask when you're thinking about digital transformation. You know, if I have a company that was established 100 years ago, then when tells the history and the story of that organization. What were we doing in 1920 that was successful and was a good idea that allows us 100 years later to still be in business? You know, that when question is going to start to, or the answer to the when question starts to describe the culture of the business. You know, who had the idea? What is the history of the owners? What was going on in 1920 that sparked the mission of the organization? And how did that mission change over the entire existence of the company? That win question is very important when you look into the past. The win question is also very important when you look in the present. Under today's circumstances, given the history of the organization, what are we doing and where are we going? And how do we know that we've arrived there? You know, the where kind of takes up where when leaves off and then continues the story. Where are we going is describing the answer to the question about what are our initiatives? What are our goals? Where do we want to be in three years or in five years? I can't start developing the strategy for what we're going to do in the future until I understand who we are and where we've come from. And so when you think about the strategy conversation, a lot of people sit down and start planning their corporate strategy and all they do is look to the future and they never consider the history of the organization that we're dealing with or the drivers or the influencers that caused us to be where we are today, which might have some impact on where we're going in the future. You know, the why is wrapped up in all of this. It's like a silk thread that is used to tie our history and our people and the direction that we're going together. You know, if we're making widgets, again, I said, why are we making a widget? Why is the widget gold? Why are we um, continuing to make widgets? Whatever the answer is to that question is going to continue to influence the perspective that you have about the entire business and the understanding that you have about how the business operates and what they're doing. And all of these questions ultimately lead into the foundation of our conversation. If I have a business that produces widgets, it is imperative that I, as a security person, understand how that business is accomplished. You know, if we're doing the full manufacturing, taking the raw materials, combining them together, and then generating an output that we can put it into a box and sell it to a customer, the answer to how is going to be critical because how is going to influence my threat modeling, my risk assessment, my vulnerability management. I have to know what I'm focusing on and what's important. You know, you think about things like business impact analysis, where I'm trying to identify the recovery point objective and the recovery time objective when I'm doing business continuity planning. That is usually where people start and stop their business impact analysis conversation. But there's a lot that you can learn when you're trying to align your security strategy with the business strategy. If I've done a business impact analysis, what I understand related to the how question is the critical infrastructure. What are our mission essential functions? You know, I might be in a manufacturing plant that also sells um, trinkets. The credit card machine that supports our ability to sell trinkets really has nothing to do with the core business of the organization. And so answering the how question about the core business processes is going to be very valuable because that's really the place that you're going to start to align security obligations with the needs of the business and make sure that everybody is on the same page and working in harmony with each other. Now, once you complete all of the business analysis, again, we've gone on a journey. We started at the inception of the organization 
whether it was 100 years ago or 10 years ago, we sought to understand why did the business form? What were they trying to do? What are they trying to accomplish? Where are they going in the future? As I continue that exploration, the next step on the journey is to identify how and whether or not security is going to contribute to the success of the organization. You know, if I'm making widgets, security can contribute to the success by providing risk management and security controls for our SCADA systems and the industrial control systems that are part of the manufacturing process. You know, if I understand how we're doing operations in an operating room at a hospital and they're doing telemedicine and somebody across the world is using the internet to control a robot because it gives you access to the world specialist who can only perform the operation, but they can't get on a plane because of COVID, we want to understand what is the risk to that specialized activity that is going to influence whether or not somebody is going to be saved by the surgery and whether or not we can bring the best person in the world to contribute to our success. From a security perspective, if we take the scenario that I presented, for telemedicine that is happening around the world, I have access control, I have privacy, I have protected health information, I have electronic medical records. How am I going to send the information to that doctor on the other side of the world so that the doctor knows all of the health conditions about the patient that are going to influence the approach to the surgery, the medicines that are prescribed beforehand, the medicines that are prescribed afterwards, so that we're not just doing a surgery, but we're thinking about the entire care of the individual. No matter the industry, no matter the organization, no matter the type of activity that you're performing, understanding the business, all of those things that we talked about on the previous slide is going to put you in a position as a security leader to think about how can I make things better or whether or not I am making things better. You know, if the power goes out, if somebody hacks into the um, telehealth system in the middle of the surgery and the patient is harmed, obviously security is not making things better. You know, in some cases security gets in the way because security is so hyper-focused on regulatory requirements or compliance requirements or something unrelated to the mission of the business that security becomes a distraction more than being a contributor to what the business is trying to accomplish. And so sometimes as a security executive or as a security professional, you have to really sit back and contemplate what is going on with the business and where are they going and how am I gonna to contribute to their success? Sometimes credit card processing and compliance with PCI DSS is an add-on or a benefit, but really has nothing to do with the mission of the organization. Or sometimes ISO 27001 certification, while it looks good from a sales and marketing perspective, does not necessarily have significant impact on the way that your company operates or how they do their business or how they deliver their services to their constituents. You know, I had a very good conversation in another online discussion yesterday what we were talking about the impact of COVID on healthcare regulations. Most global healthcare regulations, whether you're in Singapore or you're, the, or you're in the United States or anywhere else in the world, healthcare organizations say that you are going to strictly control access to patient information. If the patient is in the medical facility, the only people that need to see that patient's records are the doctors and the nurses performing the service. But then you start to sit back and you think about, all right, we're doing all of these things. If it's HIPAA, we put the security rule in place. We've managed the privacy rule. We've got our HIPAA certification. Everybody's happy. But with COVID, I need to know as a cleaning crew, as a janitor, as somebody who is going to service the room while the patient is in there or after the patient has left, what is the condition of this person? Are they highly contagious? If the answer is yes, then I need to put on different equipment so that I can clean the room or sanitize the room. If the person isn't highly contagious, then I don't need to worry about it. But now we're getting into a situation where people who have nothing to do with delivering healthcare services to the patient need some level of access to the information about the patient. In this context, we're basically violating security and privacy rules, but the violation of those rules is necessary so that we can make sure that we take care of all of the people in the hospital, not just protect the privacy and the rights of one individual. And so then you end up with this balance between should security come to the table and find a better way to satisfy the requirements or a way to adjust the requirements so that we're meeting the obligation 
of the privacy or the security rule, while at the same time, we are actually saving people's lives and preventing additional people from getting infected. All of this is going to lead into ultimately just the culture of the organization as it relates to security. Um, when you talk about culture, culture is the collection of attitudes and beliefs and behaviors and the way that you do something within a community or a group of people. And so that community can be your company, that community can be the neighborhood that you live in, that community can be the country that you come from. Um, for example, I was born in Italy, so I love Italy very much because it's my home country. I live in the United States. The United States has a culture. I love the United States because it's where I lived for significant amounts of time. Singapore has a unique culture. I love the people, I love the food, I love the hospitality, but whether you're talking about Italy or the United States or Singapore, the attitudes, the perspectives, the beliefs, and the way that each country does things has a distinct culture that drives the behavior of everybody within the country. And so then you take the idea of culture and you boil it down to a micro scale instead of a macro scale. And you say, what does culture have to do with the conversation? If we're talking about balancing business needs and security obligations, and we are trying to align security practices with the business. Well, years ago, I don't remember the date, but ISACA in the business model of information security said that a culture of security establishes a pattern of beliefs, behaviors, assumptions, attitudes and ways of doing things. And so if you look at everything that's on the culture wheel and you look at the language, the way that we talk when we have a strong security culture is going to represent the awareness of risk management, the attitude about risk management, the perspective that people have about the controls that need to be put in place and the behaviors that need to exist so that we protect the organization. If we have a strong security culture, then the way that people use tools and objects within the environment whether they allow users to have administrative access or you restrict administrative access only to system and domain administrators and maybe developers, and then you have a formal process for requests for software installation, all of those controls that we're used to as security people are going to be representative of the culture of the organization. You know, Alex and I as consultants talk to all kinds of organizations. It's not just one organization, but you would not believe how many organizations that I've gone into and the initial assessment when we're talking to the business discovers that 100% of the employees have administrative access. You know, now we're way back at the beginning when we talked about the capability and maturity model specific for security because everybody can do whatever they want to do. You know, people can look at inappropriate content, they can download software. We're spending thousands of dollars on enterprise class endpoints and workstations and people are downloading video games and spending all of their time playing World of Warcraft or um, player unknown battleground instead of doing their job. And so the things that people do and the way they behave and the attitudes that they have about the security requirements and the risk management requirements and the approach that the organization takes to maintain risk at an acceptable level is going to be a component of the security culture that exists. And that security culture is going to have to start at the top of the organization. Now, when you start at the top of the organization, one thing that you're gonna to have to look at is based on our governance model and the example that is demonstrated by the leadership of the organization, is it satisfactory or is it inappropriate for people to behave badly? You know, behavior is often driven by corporate culture and what is allowed at the organization as demonstrated by your executive leadership. And so you, if for those of you who have been doing security for a long time, I remember early in the days when the iPad was first released. This was a very exciting solution. Everybody wanted one. Nobody could afford one except for the corporate executives. And so you think about the culture of the organization where we have a corporate policy that says only corporate owned devices are allowed to connect to company email and have access to company files. But then you have a collection of senior executive members who are not part of the technology team or who are not part of the security team. And they say, you know what? I don't care what the policy is. I want, I bought an iPad and I want to do my work on the iPad because the iPad is new and interesting. And so we have all of these controls in place. We have all these risk mitigation factors. We've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars on technical, physical, and administrative controls to ensure that we can control the environment 
and reduce the likelihood that we're going to have a data breach or a compromise. And now here comes the director of sales and marketing that says, I must have an iPad and we have no control whatsoever to support it. And so in the organization with a good culture, with mature culture that is going to enforce the rules and the requirements, they're going to say, look, I appreciate your request. Your request violates the rules. The rules apply to everybody. The answer to your question is no. In other organizations, and I've seen this time and time again, and it started with the iPad, but it happens with all kinds of things. The organization is going to submit to the request of the executive. Submitting to the executive is going to expose the organization to risk for which we have no control. And then you have a data breach that exposes 10 million records because one executive had to have an iPad and they had to connect their iPad to the corporate email because they did not want to use their company issued laptop to get access to their calendar. Now it sounds ridiculous, but if you travel around the world and you interview 10,000 companies, a significant percentage of companies are going to bend the rules for special people, whether because they're executives and they're senior in the organization or because the squeaky wheel gets the oil and some people just run around and cry and complain until they get what they want. And so understanding this nuance exists and understanding that people in the business are going to drive the organization to make bad decisions, it increases the importance of developing a strong culture within the organization and making sure that you have good governance practices in place. And the beginning of governance is going to be policy. Do we have a policy that says what people can and cannot do? Do we reinforce the policy with procedures and standards and guidelines with technical controls, with oversight, with review boards? Is it a collaborative approach so that everybody in the organization is holding all of the other people accountable? If the answer is yes, that's not only good for security, but is good for the business. It's going to stop people from abusing corporate assets for their own personal gain. It's going to stop people from using the company credit card to buy a PlayStation 5 because it's totally awesome, but it's ridiculously expensive. You know, all of these things are going to come into play and all of the behaviors are based on emotional and organizational psychology. And so when you sit back and you think about some of the crazy decisions that your business makes, sometimes those, biz those decisions seem crazy because security people are very risk averse, but from the business perspective, it makes perfect sense. You know, some business people operate under psychological pressures, emotional pressures, and business drivers that security people don't understand because they have a different experience. There are also emotional and organizational psychology concerns that come into play that manifest themselves very differently based on your level within the organization. You know, if I'm a um, individual contributor, I come to work, I clock in, I do my job, I clock out, I go home. That is a specific set of pressures that are related to my job that I'm coming to do. And then you add my role as security. So I come to work, every day I'm dealing with an incident, every day I'm dealing with a data breach. There's never enough time to solve all the problems. I'm always failing. This is the reason that the RSA conference talked about the human element. And we've spent so much time in 2020 talking about people's feelings and talking about burnout. It's all of the pressures that people are facing are going to influence their behavior. And so having a strong culture, having good governance over the way that the business operates, and then tying security into that fabric is going to create a situation where everything is not going to be perfect, but everything is going to be much better and is going to operate more smoothly. It also counteracts some of the bad psychological pressures that happen as you go higher in the organization. And so you have things like optimism bias, that cause the business executives to be so positive that regardless of the information you present to them, they think that nothing is going to happen to them. And so I could be in the financial services industry. You know, most of the um, attendees on the call today for the live session are from Singapore. And so if you're in Singapore and you work in the financial services sector, the uh, MAS has a requirement that you communicate to the ministry if there is a data breach in the financial services industry. And even though you have this requirement, and even though everybody knows that financial services is probably the most secure industry because it's heavily regulated and people apply a lot of effort to it, you still have executives in financial services organizations that make bad decisions about the controls that need to be put in place because optimism bias drives them to think all of this bad stuff exists. 
I see all kinds of information from the um, financial sector information sharing and analysis center. I'm getting threat model or threat feeds and threat intelligence from my industry and from MAS, but we are not going to spend the right kind of money on the optimal controls to reduce our risk because my optimism bias says that regardless of what's happening around me, the bad thing is not going to happen to me. And so this optimism bias also has often has a relationship to the rational choice principle that says given multiple choices available, when a person makes a decision, they're going to choose from the many choices, the thing that has the most benefit to them personally. They're not gonna think about the long-term impact. They're not gonna think about other people who are influenced by the decision. All things being equal, if there's no other constraint, no other requirement, or no other governance mechanism, rational choice principles lead people to focus on their own self-interest in the shortest term possible, rather than the long-term interest of the entire organization. And so then you keep going down the psychology trail and you get into things like confirmation bias, where regardless of the information that people receive, they are only willing to accept information that reinforces the idea that they already had. And so if I believe that um, chickens are good, I'm only gonna accept information that says chicken is the best meat that ever existed. If I hate chicken and I would rather have shrimp or fish, then everything that says the chicken is bad, that is bad for you, that is contaminated, that nobody likes it, I'm only going to accept information that confirms the belief that I already had. And so I use food so that we can stay away from politics and stay away from anything that is going to incite a riot on our conversation. But regardless of what the subject is, if I have an idea in my mind and I'm a business person and I've already thought about the other things where rational choice is going to lead me to focus on my own self-interest and optimism bias is going to focus, is going to lead me to believe that all the bad stuff is never going to happen to me, then confirmation bias is going to add to that. And I'm only going to accept information that reinforces the idea that I have in my mind that nothing is going to happen and the decision that I made is the best decision. And so all of these psychological impacts, the way that people behave and the way that people believe are going to influence what does it take for security to become a good dance partner with the business. And so now you're probably wondering, all right, I came to this presentation, Keon is talking about psychology, he's talking about business drivers, there is not a lot of technical security stuff in this conversation, and now we're talking about dancing. The idea with dancing really boils down to relationships. You know, for any of you who are in a relationship with a significant other, it's your husband, it's your wife, it's your boyfriend, it's your girlfriend, it's the long-term partner that you have been with for a meaningful amount of time. In every one of those relationships, there's a dance that people dance. Now, it doesn't have to be dancing on the dance floor, but it could just be if you closed your eyes and you sat back and you imagined, I can imagine dancing with my wife because my wife and I have been together for 25 years. I know how she's gonna to respond to my inputs. If she's stressed out and I don't support her, she's gonna be mad at me for a long time. If there's a spider on the wall and I don't jump into action and take care of the spider, she's not going to be happy. You know, it's not really dancing on the dance floor, but it's the idea that the relational aspects of people interacting with other people are going to influence how well do I get into alignment with my partner and as a security executive, as an individual contributor, as anybody who's doing security within the organization, I have a lot of dance partners. So now the question becomes for different dance partners that I'm doing a dance with and for different music that we're going to hear on the dance floor, what is the right way to dance with different people? For some people, it's gonna be a very close intimate dance like the waltz. For other people, it's going to be country line dancing because it's inappropriate for you to be that close to each other and everybody has to be spread out and has to be um, in unison. But regardless of the dance and regardless of the music, there's going to be some level of choreography. There's going to be some level of rhythm so that you're on the same beat. You're dancing to the beat of the same drummer instead of listening to two different songs in the same room. This harmony and the relationship that you develop with your counterparts is going to make a huge difference when you're trying to balance the needs of the business and the obligations that security has, because now you have understanding. If the business understands why am I so focused on PCI DSS, why is it so important that we put um, antivirus or why is it so important 
that we spend money on preventive controls like firewalls and IDS and IPS, for some people it's just technology and there is no awareness of what that technology does or the value that it brings to the organization. And then for other people, it's the most important thing that ever existed in the world. And so if you have two people coming from different perspectives, coming from different directions, but we're all working to support the same organization, there's gotta be some time that you spend with your partner so you can figure out how we dance together. And so maybe with the CIO, because I'm a security person and technology and security often have a very close relationship, it's going to be a closer, slower dance because we're taking our time, we're trying to solve an important problem and we're in this together. You know, for other people, maybe the uh, CISO and the CFO, instead of a very slow, intimate, romantic dance, it's a waltz. We're still close together, but it's upbeat. Everybody's moving around. Everything is very flowy, but we're together. We're synchronized, we're choreographed, we're on the same sheet of music, we're on the same beat, we're working together. What you often end up with, where I've described these very elegant dances that people do together, what you often have is break dancing. Everybody's all over the place. They're moving in different directions. You can't even tell that they're listening to the same music, but that chaos that exists is because there's not a relationship between the dance partners. You know, if you've been around long enough to have seen the original break dancing that was started in New York, every break dancer was either by themselves and everybody's around them looking at them, or it's a dance battle. And so one person is competing with another person. And so they're showing off as much as possible to be the winner of the dance battle, but there's no connection. There's no collaboration. There's no communication between the dance partners because they're battling and competing with, with each other rather than being in harmony with each other and being connected and working together to solve the problem. And so the moral of this story is you came to this presentation not knowing that we were gonna end by talking about dancing you had no idea that I was gonna give you a semester worth of psychology as part of the conversation. But what we're really trying to do is highlight that good security depends upon a good relationship with the business. If I have a good relationship with the business, if the business has good culture, if everybody is on the same sheet of music, dancing the same dance at the same time on the same beat, it's going to increase the likelihood that I as a security person understand the needs of the business and I'm working to support them because I'm a good partner and the business is going to stay in the obligations that I'm facing because I'm not there to be annoying or to disrupt the business as a professional security object, as a professional security executive, my mission is to help the business flourish and do what they're there to do. If we're cranking out widgets, I'm trying to make sure that the widget manufacturing process is as secure and resilient as possible and has the least amounts of interruptions. If we're providing healthcare services, I am there as a security person to ensure that the business has met their obligations because those obligations are often going to protect the healthcare patients who are our customers. And so the business has to understand that security is there to help you and security has to understand how is the business behaving and why are they behaving? And the music that brings everybody together is gonna to be good governance, good oversight, and good communication. And so the objective of this presentation was to talk for about 45 minutes. I'm about a minute over, but we'll say that we started two minutes late. Uh, Alex and I would love to connect with you to have a conversation. You know, there's plenty of time. We left time for Q&A, but if you're still trying to come to grips about this craziness that I have presented to you in a cybersecurity presentation and you got dance lessons and you got psychology lessons and you got business school lessons and we have left you wanting more. Wanting more is good because it means that you will engage in a conversation with us. Um, you can us on LinkedIn, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, under normal circumstances, I am always in Singapore all the time because I love Singapore and we're still working to get Alex to come to the United States. But Alex and I are dancing very well together because Class LLC and Insights are partners. And so we understand each other. We're listening to the same music. We're dancing to the beat of the same drummer. And the music that we're listening to is the music of connection and collaboration so that we can help our other friends in security accomplish all the same things that we've accomplished. And so that we can help the businesses that need help accomplish what they need to do as well because most businesses don't know that in the heart of hearts for your CISO, there really is a fabulous tango dancer. 
And so with that, I will open it up for um, questions. Again, if you joined us late, if you click on the participants tab, you'll see the voting buttons. You can raise your hand. Once you raise the, your hand, I'll give you the floor and I'm happy to answer anything that you would like to cover as part of this conversation. And then if you are feeling shy, you can also um, type something in the chat and we'll be happy to answer the um, typed questions as well. Okay, thank you, Chien. Um, anybody from the floor would like to uh, have the first question? If not, I have one for Kian. Okay, uh, we, we talked about a lot of cultures and, and dancing. Uh, for the lack of security culture in, in a, a typical organization, should we force through the security measures and control or try to change the culture first, given that it's usually very difficult to change an ingrained culture? Um, I would start at the top. Um, one of the problems that I had in a previous job when I was working full time as the CISO was that my predecessor was so frustrating to work with that on the organizational chart, they buried the role at the bottom of the organizational chart. So even though my title was CISO, my position was equal to the janitor when you look at the organizational chart and see how things work. And so one of the opportunities that you have is, you know, we talked about the business and how they're structured and who the people are. If you're having a problem with culture within the organization, your best friend should be the person of significant influence. And so in my case, when on the organization chart, the janitor could have been my, the person to whom I reported directly because I was so low on the chart. The um, program management office, the director of the PMO was the person who became a very good friend and nobody in the organization could get anything done if the PMO didn't approve it. And so now through that relationship with the program management office, I got the PMO to understand these are the security things that are going to protect the organization and instead of me being the messenger, the person of the greatest influence became the messenger while we continue to work in the background to change the culture. You know, so your alignment with the business isn't just the entire business. Sometimes your alignment with the business is just one person. And that one person who understands the needs of the organization and has influence over the behavior of the organization is enough to get started instead of trying to change the entire culture of the company to get everybody on board to follow the right security practices. Fair enough and a good strategy. Uh, any other questions from the floor? Uh, I guess us Singaporeans are usually uh, the sh shy lot. Uh, well, we got one question here. Yep, so the, uh, the question that we got talks about the uh, most effective way to balance business and cybersecurity requirements. Um, it's going to sound strange, but I think the business impact analysis is going to be the best way to find the balance because the outcome of your business impact analysis is going to be the identification of what's most important to the business. You know, people often look at it as the recovery point objective, the recovery time objective, and it's my backup schedule. But if you don't do the impact analysis, you have no idea what's critical to the organization. Once you identify what's critical, then you can start working with the business to say, look, if this critical thing stops working, everybody's going to have a problem. It's not about compliance. It's not about regulations. It's not about best practices. What is the most effective way for us within the organization to protect the critical assets that have been identified? And so starting with an understanding of how things work, which is why we talked about it very early in the conversation, is going to help you balance your business and your security requirements because the business cares about keeping things running, especially if that's how they're gonna get their bonus and security cares about protecting things that are critical to the business. You know, one thing that I'll add to that before we go forward is another aspect of that um, conversation is really looking at um, the operational procedures. You know, you can be in a very immature organization and it does not matter how immature the organization is, there is some way that that company makes money because if they're not making money, people aren't getting paid. And so in some cases, if you combine my answer to the two questions, the chief financial officer is going to be the person that I work with to make sure that the CFO understands the value 
of the security things that I'm doing. And then the CFO is going to tell other people, you are messing with my money. Please go listen to what Keon has to say. What he has to say is important. And so it's always going to come back to relationships and it's always going to come back to understanding how the business operates and how they do the most important things that they do. All right, so it seems that my dear friends in Singapore, even though it is 11 o'clock in the morning instead of 11 o'clock in the evening like it is in the US, are um, either satisfied because this presentation has been so mind-blowing that there are no additional questions, or you have not had enough coffee and you're not awake yet. And so <laughs> we don't have to stay in conversation just because we still have time on the clock. What I will say is if you'd like to take a screenshot, this slide is the best way to capture the way that you contact me and or Alex. Uh, the other thing that I'll say is that the cyber strategy retreat is going to be another opportunity for you to hear conversations like this. Uh, we did one in July. We had 22 speakers that talked about all kinds of topics for three days. The session that you'll see in for October when you go to the website is only two days. And even though we're in different time zones, all of the sessions are recorded and there is going to be at least one opportunity for you to participate in a live session even if you're in the um, Asia Pacific region. Plus there are all kinds of opportunities to connect with your peers and hear great conversations in another setting, just like this, where it's relational, it's conversational, and you're having a good time. Yep. I say Singaporeans are the shy lots. They, they don't ask a lot of questions, uh, maybe online. Uh, so like uh, what Kian say, Feel free to reach out to us, uh, either uh, Kian directly as it's at his email or LinkedIn or to me. And uh, today's uh, presentation is definitely a, a, a eye opener. It's, it's definitely very different from the typical cybersecurity or even security strategy uh, a webinar and talks that we've been to. So um, thank you, Kian, for the, the uh, enlightening topic and an interesting uh, topic.